and make it slightly bigger. Okay, and this is not. Okay, good morning, everyone. Go ahead. Oh, if you're speaking in the mic. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, we're reaching a bit the close uh, close to the end of the delivering contents from the teachers. It's another morning with Tania Dad and with Katarina, who just arrived. She's uh, at the, at the end of the the room. Her nameplate is uh, over there. Um, <laughs> Pass it down. Uh, welcome, Katerina, for and thank you for making yourself available for the, a very short period. Um, so we're going to have a, a couple of um, sessions during the morning, and then in the afternoon you're going to be starting your uh, mini project to present tomorrow. So I'm not going to okay. take more time. Tanya, okay. how's everybody doing this morning? Had a good dinner last night, I heard. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to actually start off um, with a little bit of a background of, uh, of myself and uh, uh, working in Oregon and in the United States in the context of ICZM, just because I think that it would be interesting maybe for the group. We've seen a lot of projects from a lot of different areas. Um, and I think that there might be some interesting items that you can pull out of our model that might be useful. Um, ICZM in the United States uh, basically began with the passage of the Coastal Zone Management Act in 1972. This was a, one of many kind of environmental focused laws that were passed in the United States around this time. This is when we got our uh, first Clean Water Act, our first Clean Air Act, uh, several large environmental agencies were formed, and um, the Coastal Zone Management Act was designed to be a program that would help uh, coastal states um, deal with uh, those extra environmental issues that affect the coast. So essentially there was environmental laws that affect the whole country, clean water, clean air, but at the coast they perceived that there was extra environmental topics that might need to be addressed and so that was what this program was designed to address. And the pro <coughs> program is designed to be a, a partnership program between the federal government and the state, state governments. Uh, so there are, it's a voluntary program, if a state doesn't want to participate it doesn't have to. But there are incentives to participate, uh, two major incentives, in fact. And so that those incentives uh, usually mean that most states do participate. Uh, so actually, on the next slide, I have a list. These are all the, the coastal United States, um, 35 in all, uh, including territories and Great Lake states. Um, all of these uh, are now participating in the coastal management program with the exception of the one that has the little star which is Alaska. Uh, Alaska used to participate but it pulled out of the program uh, several years ago for reasons that have to do with disagreements with the federal government. Uh, they basically felt that the incentives, the positive incentives were not worth the negatives of participating in their opinion. So. Uh, So now I'm going to talk about how that national program is uh, kind of applied in Oregon. Oregon is, uh, is the state where I work. Um, Oregon is on the west coast of the United States. It's above California and below the state of Washington. And it became a state in 1859. I'm giving you a little bit of history here because um, I feel like it, I didn't know anything about Oregon before I moved there, so it's likely that a lot of you guys don't know anything about Oregon. And there's some interesting things that I've learned about it uh, in terms of its history uh, and, and its relationship to the various environmental laws. So the first thing I'm going to point out is that the, that the uh, image on the upper right is the, the seal of the state of Oregon. And what you notice if you look in the center of it is that there's a covered wagon pulled by cows <laughs> or ox. And, then, and that's the sort of legend story of how the state of Oregon was formed. People ca uh, came out west in covered wagons on something called the Oregon Trail. Uh, and it was happening in the mid-1800s. Um, and uh, the state was finally formed once there was enough people in that territory to form a government in 1859. 
the uh, image below the steel <laughs> of Oregon is a, is a screenshot from a, a, a 1980s computer game called the Oregon Trail, which was like a choose-your-own-adventure text-based computer program where, you know, as you, as you journeyed through the, the trail, you, each time you reached a fork, you could make a decision about where to go, and if you made the wrong decision, you would die of some terrible disease or something like that. <laughs> And so this is a rather kind of famous game from the 80s that uh, is uh, considered one of the first like role-playing adventure games in, in, on computers. Uh, the reason I mentioned both of those things about the wagon trains is because uh, a few years ago I heard an interesting story about the culture of the state of Oregon. Uh, and the story goes like this. When all those people were in those covered wagons coming west, uh, there was a point at which uh, you got mo you got three quarters of the way to the west coast, and there's a fork in the trail, and you have a choice to take the fork that goes slightly to the south, w in which case you would end up in California, or you could take the fork that went slightly to the north, and you would end up in Oregon. And so, does anybody know what might have been going on in California uh, ten years before the state of Oregon was formed? 1849. Sports fans? No. So, in 1849, there was a huge gold rush in California. So, all these people who were on the trail, uh, you know, had dreams of making it, making it big, making their new lives. And when they got to the fork, the ones that wanted to get rich quick, they went south and they went to California to, to look for gold. Uh, if you took the northern road, all that was promised was that if you uh, settled on a piece of land and you farmed it for five years, then the government would give that land to you. So it was like more of a long-term investment and kind of something that maybe wouldn't pan out. But uh, it was the kind of thing that if you were like, you thought of yourself as hardworking, it seemed like more sure thing than striking the rich in the gold rush. So what that means is in general, the founders of the state were kind of more conservative people who thought of themselves as like not very <laughs> flash in the pan, uh, riches seeking people, but they were kind of more hardworking people that didn't mind like uh, working in kind of the dark and the cold and the rain for five years in order to earn their fortune. Uh, this, I think, this story kind of illustrates that um, I would say that the the some of the founding laws in the state of Oregon have a very, very practical basis. They don't really like taking risks. They are very big on the precautionary principle. Uh, and you sort of see this reflected in all kinds of things, even now that it's 150 years since the state was founded. So some major environmental laws in Oregon. Uh, in 1913, the, uh, the government of the state decided that the entire coast of the ocean from California border to the Washington border uh, would be declared a state highway. And this is because our mountains come so close to the coast that we had no flat land really to build any roads on. So before roads and highways were built, the easiest way to go north and south was to tra travel on the beach. So they made the beach part of the highway system. And what that led to was uh, a very early commitment to the beaches being in the public domain. In the, by the 1960s, this was essentially passed into a formal law that even if there was private ownership at the coast, the beach itself, up to an elevation of 16 feet, or wherever the, the vegetation ends, has a public easement on it and is part of the public domain. And that, that bill is called the Oregon Beach Bill. It uh, celebrated its 50-year anniversary last year. And then finally, uh, the last big piece of Oregon legislation that I'll mention is in, uh, at the same time that all those big national environmental laws were being passed, in Oregon, uh, after some quite a lot of building that had happened in the post-war years, by the early 1970s, they were really get, starting to get worried about sprawl. And uh, so they decided to pass a bill, Oregon Senate Bill 100, uh, that instituted statewide land use planning. And 
land use planning, as you'll see, has come to have a strong role in coastal protection. So what is land use planning in Oregon look like? Uh, basically, uh, the program sets out 19 goals statewide uh, that are high-level goals that local communities should aspire to, to meet. And now each local community can choose their own way of meeting the goals. Um, but the way that they do that is they create a plan for the community um, that addresses each of these 19 areas. Uh, the goal, I've pasted a list of the goals here. They're too, probably too small to read. But they go from goal one, which is citizen involvement, through uh, some resource-related protection goals for agricultural lands, forest lands, uh, wetlands, natural resources, and then into the, into the uh, middle uh, f five or six goals relate to cities and uh, providing housing for people, economic development, public facilities, transportation, uh, e energy consumption. And then down at the bottom, you'll see that uh, the last five goals relate to waterways or the coast. Um, and of course, these, these last five goals actually only apply to sp those specific waterways and the coast. And uh, so if your community is in eastern Oregon, nowhere near the coast, these last four goals do not apply to you. So I'll start to talk about the goals now. Uh, the Coastal Zone Management Program in Oregon is built using a network model. Uh, that's one of the models that NOAA allows for states who create programs. The network model basically uh, puts the administrative responsibility for the program in one agency and then distributes the authorities of the program into other agencies. So in Oregon, the central agency is the land use planning program. And then much of the other work that is not planning related happens in other agencies. So the fisheries work happens in the fisheries and wildlife agency. And the uh, mineral rights work happens in the land, uh, the state lands agency that owns the lands of the state, etc. Um, the, since the center of the program is in the land use planning program, uh, the four coastal goals that are part of the land use planning program are really kind of a bedrock uh, of the program that trickle through um, the management of the resources in the coastal zone. So this map that I have on the right here shows a sort of a sh shaded uh, out version of the Co Oregon coastal zone. It consists of uh, all of the watersheds that flow from the coastal mountains down to the coast and then it goes out three miles to the, uh, the border of the state territorial sea. And it's inside of this zone that the four coastal goals apply. The four coastal goals are divided into the resources that they protect. So goal 16 protects estuaries, goal 17 protects the shorelands along water bodies, uh, goal 18 protects beaches and dunes, and goal 19 protects ocean areas. And so uh, in, in the European context, uh, goal 19 in Oregon is where our marine spatial planning occurs. But the goal 19 butts up against goal 18 on the shoreline and so on, which butts up against the estuaries uh, on the inland, and all of the plans nest together to give kind of a seamless coverage of the landscape. So the link I've got at the bottom of this page is a link to the program uh, that I work for, the program that ho ho houses the home of the Coastal Zone Management Program. And if you're interested in uh, learning more about the goals, uh, you can visit that link. And there's information about not just the coastal goals, but all of the, the land use planning goals in Oregon. So now, now that I've explained that background, sort of start to talk about the GIS data needs of, of working in CZM program in Oregon. And I've just arranged this list basically uh, by the goals because that's how our program is organized. So just to give you a general idea, if goal 16 is protecting estuaries, then one of the things that goal 16 says is in order to protect estuaries, you know, need to know where the good resources in the estuaries are. So you must create ha habitat inventory maps of the resources in the estuary. And so 
in order to uh, comply with goal 16 in a local plan, the local jurisdiction must have access to good maps of the estuary habitats. And then they use those maps to draw zones that say what's permissible in each part of an estuary. There's more to it than that, but that's the general idea. So we take that model like, uh, that we have for goal 16 and protecting the resources that are covered by goal 16, and the same principle applies to goal 17 for shorelands, goal 18 for beaches and dunes, and goal 19 for ocean areas. Some of these, uh, some of these uh, topic areas are more cross-cutting than others. So while the estuary goal primarily focuses on habitat protection, um, the shorelands goal, because people live along the shorelands, tends to have both habitat and human-related uh, inventories that are required. So you need to uh, inventory the habitats along the shorelands, but you also need to know the hazards that exist along the shoreland edges. Uh, you need to know the human uses that are along the shoreline edges that are water dependent, the ones that have to be on the water. Um, and you need to inventory things like economic resources that are dependent on the water bodies, recreational resources that are dependent on the water bodies, and things like coastal access that relate to uh, both recreation and economic uses of the waterways. So a goal 17 inventory for protecting the uses related to shorelands is kind of a much more diverse inventory of GIS data that's needed. Uh, let's see, goal 18 for beaches and dunes uh, is kind of similar in that way, but a bit more focused because beaches and dunes is a pretty narrow type of, of, of uh, geomorphology. In addition to inventorying the beaches themselves and the dune areas and dune types themselves, you're also required to inventory things like the shoreline armoring structures, the development status of the ocean facing properties, and uh, both formal and informal access points, developed and undeveloped, because uh, regardless of how people get to the coast, whether it's legal or illegal, it's important to know where it's happening, uh, because sometimes something that starts out as a little goat trail down the hill becomes a major major access point at some point. Uh, and then goal 19 ocean areas, as I mentioned, is kind of the, the giant <laughs> bucket uh, within which like marine spatial planning topics occur. And so in Oregon, when we, when we pull GIS uh, data to cover ocean area planning, we're really pulling wide swaths of, of data uh, in, in the um, sort of physical characteristics of the, the geography of the marine landscape, the biological resources that live there, and the human uses and activities that occur there. And those three giant areas of, of, of data uh, are what go into the planning of the topics in the ocean areas goal. So um, I give you all that background because on the first day when you guys were presenting your projects, I was kind of listening and watching your slides and looking at the legends and the maps that were in all of your slides and kind of making notes of the data that you guys were mentioning uh, using. And I, I, I fed all the, the list of all the words into one of those Wordle uh, programs. It came out like this. Um, these were all the words that were mentioned in your projects. And I think, I think it's kind of interesting. The larger the word is, the more it was mentioned. So it gives you kind of an idea uh, of the range of topics that were mentioned just in this room and the topics that, it, that you guys were, were dealing with. And I would say, you know, if I ran my list of data through the same program without even looking at your projects, like a lot of the same things would show up uh, in similar sizes. Um, so I think that that's kind of, I think that that's kind of interesting. Um, let's see. So in the uh, platform, it's called, uh, we put in a poll about um, different, different categories of data. Uh, and the poll uh, 
it includes it's really just three que the th three questions that ask slightly different var variations on which data categories are important to you which data categories are important to your project or your program which data ca uh, categories are uh, something you would like to use but are difficult for you to find and then um, which data categories are data categories which your program or project is responsible for collecting. Um, and the category choices that are in this poll are, are just the standard ISO data, thematic data choices that are uh, explained in the linked PDF below the poll. So if, you're, if you don't know exactly what's contained in, uh, in one of the um, data categories, you can open the PDF and it will have an explanation of what is in the data category. So I would suggest taking this poll so that we can look at the results here in a few minutes just to see in general what the group is kind of interested in or finding difficult. Does everybody find that poll? Pretty quick. Okay. I think actually we forgot to open the tab for that. So I might have to, Claudia. The presentation is not open. Okay. Yeah, the poll should definitely be open. Yeah. Let's see if I can get there myself. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I can log again. So the PDF of the thematic categories is here. Looks like this. And probably most of you are familiar with these thematic areas. It shows up in a lot of uh, GIS metadata and other tools. But sometimes it's useful to know the details of what's in each one of these. Structure? Is that in, in where is that one? Yeah, man-made construction, examples, buildings, museums, churches, factories, housing, monuments, shops, towers. As opposed to, doesn't include things like transportation because that's the next one. So I'm not sure you all responses will see what we're getting here. So it looks like environment and biota are the top winners in the data categories that are most important to your project. And then the next tier down is all tied. Boundaries, geoscientific information, base maps, inland waters, oceans, planning cadaster, and society. You can choose as many as you need. You don't have to just choose one, by the way. Okay, and then, oops. Question two. Categories that are most difficult for you to find usable data. This is interesting. Uh, imagery and base maps is winning so far. And categories that you collect, biota, environment, and imagery and base map. So a bit of a, bit of a, a puzzle there. It doesn't look like we quite have everyone yet. But we'll leave it open and you can continue to fill it in. Okay, 
So for this section, I wanted to mention just a couple of other resources that I posted. Um, for anybody who's interested in the guts of what like our territorial sea plan looks like, our Oregon territorial sea plan um, was first uh, created in the mid-1990s, and it was designed to be what they call a living document. Uh, originally, I think it consisted of three or four chapters, and then over the years, as new topics have arisen and been addressed, they've just continued to add chapters to the document. And so if you click on this first link here, you will see the series of different PDFs that represent the different sections of the plan. Uh, and that might be interesting to those of you who are involved in marine spatial planning topics. Then I also uploaded four short videos um, that each cover the uh, a, a aspect of our, our coastal uh, zone management program. So each one of these uh, is a short video that you can watch anytime. I think the sh shortest one is just a few minutes long. The longest one is 12 minutes long. And um, each one covers one goal. And below it you'll find a link to the text of the goal if you're interested in what the text says. Um, a sort of a summary of what the goal contains. And at the bottom, if we have a, if we have a, a tool or something like that that's maybe particularly helpful for that goal, I've linked it at the bottom. And I've done that for all four of the coastal goals that make up our coastal zone management program. So I thought that, you know, it's a little bit tough to hit all of the resources in, uh, you know, a half hour presentation. But for those of you that have more interest in one or more of these subject matters, you can go and read or watch the, the short video. Um, okay. Should we do one more check at the poll? See if it can in there. Okay, now we have a lot more votes. Environment is still winning. And Biota is second now. And the data that's most valuable to you. And then data that's most difficult. Biota, geoscientific information, and imagery and base maps are all tied, the most difficult, with planning and cadaster next. And this one is inter interesting to me because planning and cadaster is actually one of them, is probably the most difficult one in Oregon, I would say. Um, and I, in Oregon, if I was filling this out, I would, um, so social or so societal related data is probably second. It's one of the most difficult uh, to get and utilize in a GIS. Then in terms of what you did, your programs collect, you still have biota is winning and environment second, oceans third, that all makes perfect sense. Okay, thank you guys for doing that. I'm going to go back to the slide before I finish this particular deck and go leave it on this screen for a second. And I'm kind of curious how my list of data types for Oregon kind of compares to your list for your local projects or your programs. Does it look pretty similar? Or are there things that you guys are collecting that I haven't even thought of? Something that's unique to your area, maybe? Is there anything on my list that you're curious about? Or is it all pretty self-explanatory? Aya? So, good question. Uh, the way this is structured is that goals 16 and 17 are on inland waters. So shorelands, as listed for goal 17, um, it covers lands that are within a thousand feet of an inland water body, inland waterway, or coastal lake. Um, and then to cover the rocky shores, and uh, we, we go to the goal 18 and goal 19. Um, goal 18, they've divided it there uh, between like sort of the sandy stuff is in goal 18 and the rocky stuff is in ocean areas. And that's partly because for the rocky, we have a lot of rocky coast in Oregon, and um, 
they try to protect it all the way down into the subtitle, which kind of makes it part of the territorial sea. So they've connected the Rocky Shore Management Plan to the Territorial Sea Management Plan, which is kind of our marine spatial plan. And uh, it, interesting that you asked, I, I don't know your particular interest in Rocky Shores, but um, the, the way that our plan is structured, um, it's period, all plans really are periodically re revised. And for our Territorial Sea Plan right now, they are revising part three, which is the part that deals with Rocky Shores. So we currently have that part of our plan open for comment with the public. We're doing a lot of meetings with the public, and uh, talking about some of the, rocky, the issues that are cropping up in Rocky Shores, uh, talking about whether the existing protections that we have on Rocky Shores are adequate or not, and talking about some of the things that have changed since that chapter was first written. So when they first wrote that chapter, there was, they were protecting Rocky Shores for specific types of uses, like they protected some of them for research, they protected some of them for something that's called marine gardens, where uh, people would come and learn about intertidal organisms and stuff like that. Um, and we have another category, uh, the marine research, research reserves. Um, now, 20 years later, they're looking at all these categories of protection and they're wondering like, is it worth it to have so many different kinds of protection or should we make it simpler for the public to like, just understand, you know, don't step on the sea creatures. Don't take them home with you. Don't, you know, if you need to harvest something beyond like five mussels, you should get a permit or something like that. And so they're really looking right now, they're taking a lot of comments from the public about what are some of the new issues or what are some improvements we could make in our Rocky Shore management? And that process will be going on all year until they collect enough information to make the revisions. So. Yeah, so there are some long-term monitoring sites on the Oregon coast. Um, that are part of like West Coast wide monitoring networks. Um, and so that kind of work happens in those kinds of projects. And how my agency or our program would be involved is that uh, in, the ter in our territorial sea plan, one of the things that we inventory under human uses is research. We, we inventory where long-term programs do their research so that we have that information in the maps and we can prevent development from interfering with long-term research sites. So we are not directly doing the research, but we think of the plan as helping to protect the research areas, basically. And research, research is considered like a... Uh, all the aspects of our territorial sea plan are supposed to prioritize uh, renewable uses over non-renewables, and so research is definitely considered <laughs> a non-extractive, you know, uh, long-term positive for, for the program. Any other questions? Trying? Oh. Yeah. So, uh, human uses is, is actually huge. Um, and I think I have some more detail in one of my future slides. Um, also, if... Uh, if you are uh, on the, the site and you go to the goal 19 uh, one here, the, uh, the link at the bottom here is for an old project that was called Mar Oregon Marine Map. It's no longer an active project, um, but the data has all been posted and it's because it was used as public outreach, the data was all formatted in Google Earth. So this laptop here doesn't have Google Earth, otherwise I could open it for you. I've got it open on my computer back there. If you have Google Earth locally, you can pull it down. In the top level of Mer Oregon Marine Map is those three levels, human uses, biological resources, and physical environment. And if you open up that folder, you'll see a bunch of subfolders under human uses. It covers like economy, management, uh, things like recreation are subtopics of some of those folders. Um, so there's, there's, it's, it's quite wide ranging. 
all the fisheries use areas come under human, under economy. Infrastructure or research areas comes under human uses. All of the shipping traffic, uh, tow lanes, those kinds of things all comes under human uses. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so that's probably the area where it's supposed to be handled by Goal 17, those areas that are close to the waterways. Um, but I, I didn't mention this. Um, it was kind of implied by the, the map. I mentioned that the map of our coastal zone includes the watersheds all the way up to the crest of the Coast Range Mountains. Um, but we don't, you notice that we don't have a goal that says what watersheds. So how do we cover watersheds then? Uh, the answer is that it's covered uh, by some non-coastal goals. Um, we have like a goal five that covers net, uh, riparian areas, uh, stream sites, and that's statewide. So it doesn't matter where the stream flows, the riparian areas are supposed to be protected. Now. Uh, we are currently actually fighting with our forestry department uh, because they like to cut very close to the streams and they don't like to leave too many trees standing at the edge of the stream but of course we like them to leave some trees standing because it shades the streams keeps the water cool we have uh, one of our like signature species is salmon which likes cool water and so if the water gets too hot the salmon don't want to go um, up the river anymore so we're kind of in a fight with them right now about that uh, but it's technically considered a fight that's related to a non-coastal goal uh, and we're just applying it in the coastal zone. In, in a way the fight that we're having is that we want the protections in the coastal zone to be stronger than in the rest of the state because those anadromous fish um, are, are, are in trouble and, uh, and this could be one of the ways that we help them help them out is if we get stronger protections in the coastal zone for wider stream buffers. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh, I guess vegetation would be kind of covered in land cover. Um, yeah, which would be kind of a statewide topic. Um, and I'm trying to think if we have any, we don't really have any goal related inventories that are dependent on, on vegetation. Uh, within goal 16, certain kinds of vegetation are really important. So for example, forested areas that flood are considered really important because the Oregon coast used to have a lot of forested areas that used to flood, but people cut the trees down. <laughs> uh, and so we have very few areas like that now that flood. Um, uh, also, uh, sea seagrasses and eelgrasses in the bays themselves are considered a really important category of vegetation. Um, and so, so the coastal goals pull out those vegetation types that are really important for coastal resources, but doesn't worry, they don't worry so much about other vegetation types. Uh, yeah. Yeah. accident impact like oil spills interesting yeah um, we currently so every couple of years my program uh, hosts uh, fellowships from NOAA Some recent student graduates come to work with us for their first job after school on a project and our current fellow right now is working on oil spill protection plans for the Oregon coast um, so yes um, if you want, if you, if I, I can get your email address, I can send you links to that project. It's kind of ongoing right now. It's about one and a half years into a two-year project. Um, but basically, uh, in a way, it was, a, it's a project to modernize the approach to thinking about accident protection because uh, the current plans for like if there is an oil spill were just lines drawn on a map with a pen, and they would. Like, for example, uh, if you can see my mouse here, you know, they would draw a line around this headland. They say, 
protect that. Protect that with a broom or something like that if there's an oil spill. Well, the reality is that that's like that line is 10 or 15 miles long and you can't put a broom out that that's that long. Plus this is the Pacific Ocean and uh, we have huge waves so you would never be able to hold a boom in some locations, especially in the conditions that might cause an oil spill. So her project is um, uh, taking these old unrealistic ideas and breaking them up for modern technology into uh, breaking the coast into smaller units that are more protectable and then making prescriptions for what are the types of devices that you would deploy in each unit to, um, to ensure the protection in just the first 48 hours of a spill. Because after 48 hours, the assumption is that more help will arrive and you'll get, maybe the military will be, the Coast Guard will be involved, uh, all of the big, you know, Navy might be there, etc., to help. But in the first 48 hours, it's just a local community, and so they need a plan to help them protect um, before help arrives, essentially. Yes, yeah. So we have a, a recently updated environmental sensitivity a, a map for the whole coast. Um, was done in 2015, and that was the first, the first time it had been redone since like 19... 85 or something like that. So, so, you know, sometimes when we get these data sets, we make them last a long time. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, we can, I, I assume that you maybe use something similar, if you mentioned that product. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you're actually doing the modeling, yeah. So, that's outside of the scope of Sarah's project because Sarah's project is really taking some of the predictions from those models to try to give the locals the best information that they can have in the first 48 hours. And then after that, by that time, the modelers will have arrived. They can, like, they can give them much more accurate forecasts and stuff like that. So hers is much more equipment-based and first, first response-based. Um, yeah, uh, I think there was a question from the middle here. Was that you? Oh, he did? Okay. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Dunes? Yeah. Yeah, so all of these inventories essentially. Um, yeah, you conduct an inventory, and then you use the inventory to help draw a plan map. And then the plan map goes into effect, and it has maybe a time period associated with it. Maybe it's 10 years. It depends on the plan. Um, but at, when you reach a point in time when you feel like the plan is no longer matching the environment because the environment is changing, you can trigger, it's called a plan amendment, trigger a plan amendment, which... At that point in time, you can open the plan up, you can include new maps, and you can redraw plan boundaries uh, to, to better match. In the case of dunes, actually not much remapping has been done in Oregon. Um, the way that the dunes are really handled is um, the dunes are classified by age. So there's like younger dunes that are unstable and then you know, several categories of intermediate dune and then older dunes that are very stable, they might have forests growing on top of them. And uh, that classification system kind of allows, uh, um, implies what you can do on those dunes. Because if it's like a young, unstable dune, the sand is moving all the time, you don't want anybody building near it because the dune can move <laughs> and, and, uh, or you can disrupt the flow of sediment with whatever structure you're building. And so, so those kinds of dynamic systems are not allowed to have any building happen in them. But the more stable dunes, the ones that, have, uh, that are not moving, that have vegetation growing on them, they are allowed to be developed. And so there's, uh, and then of course it's not a perfect system. There have been places where people built in not quite the right place, or they built right before the regulations went into effect. And so in some of those areas, we do have problems with people who are always fighting the dunes. Uh, for example, uh, there's one community on the Oregon coast where 
course, somebody has a nice house, it's near the beach, they want to see the water, but the dune grows up in front of them, they can't see the water. So then they hire a guy with a bulldozer to knock it down, uh, and they just think that's okay, and that's not okay. <laughs> uh, plus, the sand doesn't just disappear, it goes you know, towards their neighbors, it starts blowing around. And we have some communities that have these problems with blowing sand that you see houses with sand that in one storm, the sand will build up to the roof line of the house and have to be cleared out. Uh, it can cause a lot of damage. So in those kinds of areas where really the development is already in a not very good place, they have uh, dune mitigation plans to sort of help the community um, if they need to do some dune grading, then they, there's like a prescription for planting dune grasses to try to stabilize the sands. Well, not, not on a mass scale, no. Um, because the sand is considered part of the public beach and you're really not allowed to like move the public beach, is, you know, in the house. Well, that would be nice, but uh, it, it, in, in, in case of what they call multiple re repetitive loss homes, uh, where maybe damage is not covered by insurance, sometimes people will relocate willingly, but sometimes people are very stubborn. <laughs> maybe, yeah. A lot of times people will just hang on because it's maybe it's their dream house, maybe. You don't know why, you know. Um, but if, if it was happening to me all the t every winter, I would go crazy. <laughs> We'd all have different tolerances, yeah. Uh, but in those cases where people are really trying to hang on, they have these dune management plans that it prevents the homeowner from doing something individual to his property. It requires you to do it all as a group. Like, if we need to fix this dune, we create it all like at the same time and then we plant it all and we all take care of it so everybody's kind of invested in the success of the plan. If you just let individual homeowners do it here, there, it kind of becomes a mess. Yeah, and can really destabilize the system. Any other questions? Okay, I think we should move on to the next topic. Let's see. And I'll come, when we, uh, in the last module today, we'll, I'll come back to the, uh, some of the tools. So, but first, we're going to talk about how we take care of all this data. Okay, so now we talk, sort of talk a little bit about the data management for all this data. Um, in an environment like this, uh, especially ICZM topics, um, it's just too diverse. Um, it's really very unlikely that any one data user is, is self-sufficient in the data that they need for, for any one coastal zone management topic. Um, that's partly why I had you answer those poll questions, because it's likely maybe that your institution is is producer of biological data, but maybe you need like social or economic data to go with that in order to like answer a question about uh, relating to an environmental management topic. And it's unlikely that you are the source of that data. You have to go to a partner agency in order to get it. Um, so because of the sort of complexity of the topics or the interdisciplinary uh, nature of the topics in coastal zone management, um, this ultimately means that data needs to be shared between groups. Um, and uh, sharing data between groups really uh, can make a lot of good things happen, but as was talked about the other day, especially I think a little bit in Roger's talk, um, getting people to share data is challenging <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. Um, so everybody wants data, but for some reason sharing data is hard. Um, and so when we talk to people, we've done a lot of work with trying to get people to share data in our region. And uh, when we've done that work, um, we sort of start, uh, rather than starting with a, like an external perspective where we say, all these people want your data. Uh, we actually started from the other direction. We say, you know, um, if you get your 
organization set up to do good data management, you will be really well positioned to do data sharing. And, uh, and so the, the idea is to get the owner of the data to think of themselves as their own first customer. And of course, they are the first customer for their own data. But sometimes they're really, even though that's true, they're really not taking care of their data very well. Um, so, so part of getting people ready for sharing is getting their internal house in order. <laughs> Asking, you know, how are you storing your internal data? Um, if, if other people, if another person in your own organization asked for the data in your project, would it be, would, would they be able to find it if you were homesick? If you stayed homesick one day at work and somebody else needed the data from your project, could they find it? Um, if they can find it, uh, if they're a new, if they're a new employee, would they immediately be able to understand it? Uh, would they uh, be able to know where it came from and why it was significant, what the important parts of the data set were? All of those things have to do with how you internally document your data so inside of your organization so that over time as staff comes and goes, your organization knows what it is stewarding in terms of data. Um, and then, only then, after you kind of have all of that sort of straight for your organization, then you can kind of ask the question, well, if somebody from the outside came and asked you for data, um, would it be easy for you to respond? Because sometimes the reason why someone says, oh, no, I can't share that data with you, is not because the data is private or because there's a fee or a license. It's because they, they need to write up a bunch of explanation for how you would use it, and they want to let it out the door um, you know, with the threat that you might use it in the wrong way or something like that. And it takes too long for them to write it, so it's easier for them to just say, no, I can't share the data. So, so uh, rather than working on sort of external sharing first, to sort of work on these issues of like getting your internal data house in order. You know, you, hopefully your data stores don't look like these piles of old newspapers tied with string. <laughs> so, um, uh, the first step in sort of being prepared to share is, do you know all your customers? And, you know, you first ask this question internally. Do you know all your internal customers? And do you know what they might want to do with your data uh, now, today? You know how you're using it today, but do you know how they're going to want to use it in the future? And um, maybe you are the expert in a particular data set, but the, the really important question to ask about that is, Will you always be around to answer questions about the data? And if you can't answer, of course, none of us can answer yes to that. I guess anything could happen. Um, if you can't answer yes to that question, then you need to um, maybe begin thinking about how you could have better data storage internally in your organization or better record keeping so that uh, another user that's not you, that's not the expert, could be able to find the right data at the right time uh, and, and, and be able to use it in a productive way without having a lot of lost time and effort uh, spent trying to understand, understand what might be missing. So this inevitably brings you kind of to the topic of metadata. And Metadata is kind of like the scary M word that a lot of people don't <laughs> like to, to talk about. So part of what we do when we're talking about data sharing is sort of demystifying or, or taking the scariness out of metadata. Um, I think one of the reasons why people find metadata scary or annoying is because it can be kind of, you know, historically uh, creating metadata involved using tools that were very finicky or inflexible. Um, and people really were spending more time fighting the tools than like actually working on their own data. And so what we, what we spend a little bit of time doing is sort of trying to de-escalate the, uh, the, the, um, the stakes for metadata and just start to point out that actually metadata is kind of around us all the time. Um, we just don't really think of it that way. Um, so for example, anytime you go shopping, 
you might be picking up like a box of cereal or something off the shelf and it will have some kind of standardized information about the ingredients and the nutritional content or something like that. And that is a form of metadata. And we get used to, every country has a different format for how they push that. And this was one example from the United States, but there, even this has changed a little bit. Um, but the idea of having sort of a standardized way of showing this is that then you can take two cereal boxes off the shelf and you can compare them and you can say, well, I, I, I really don't want this much sugar in my cereal, so you put one back and you take the healthier one and you purchase it. Um, so, you know, you, once you get people thinking about metadata in more kind of a everyday kind of a way, people start um, internalizing the utility of metadata. They're like, yeah, I use it every day. Um, and you realize that metadata actually helps people make decisions all the time. Which data set is more important? Which box of cereal is more healthy? That kind of thing. Uh, it helps users um, choose which data set is right for their problem. So when we're trying to get people to kind of dip their toe into, into metadata, uh, if they really haven't done anything before, we say start small. Start uh, Rather than going full hog STI, you can start with uh, just creating a small local data dictionary for your project. Um, and in the, uh, in the platform, I linked to a blog post about how to create a data dictionary. So just a very quick, uh, quick and easy read that came across my email a few days ago, and I thought that it was useful for this, this level of, of sort of someone maybe working in a small shop um, uh, uh, who needs to document the data that's in, in, their, in their group. Do you have a question? Well, it's in the blog post, but a, blog, uh, but a data dictionary, just to give you like the short version, is um, actually can just be in the form of like a, a, a written document that as a table that lists the data sets and a, a paragraph about what, what they contain or what's important about each data set. You can think of it as like a first inventory. Like say you came to a new job, the old guy left. He left six months before you started, so you can't ask him any questions. You're there like to try to figure out what's going on. It's your job to sort of get the house in order. The data dictionary might be the first thing you create um, from the information that you can find. And maybe eventually you can start to interview people, like, okay, how was this data set created? When, 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 and you put that information in the data dictionary. It's not formal metadata, but it's a very good start um, because it's a document that you can like post on your internal intranet, and other people in the organization can see how you're doing it, etc. So um, we could call it like baby catalog or something like that. But it's actually um, it's actually used quite it's a term that's used quite a lot in like data science. You create a data dictionary before you create like more complex forms of metadata. Uh, and then that idea of a data dictionary is really kind of flows well into this concept that we are surrounded by human readable metadata all the time. We write reports, journal articles, uh, uh, grant, grant reports to the people who are our funders. And all those documents um, talk about the projects that we did. They talk about the results of the science that we did. They are forms of metadata. However, they require humans to read them. They've got beautiful graphics and photos, um, but there's no way that I can have a stack, stack of reports and easily search them using a computer for, uh, for data sets that might m meet the needs of a future project. And so this is where, once people are comfortable with sort of standard kinds of metadata, we start to get people into using machine-readable <coughs> metadata. And uh, to go back to this example of the nutritional uh, thing on the cereal box, this box is the human readable metadata. It's intended for you or me to read. And then the barcode on the bottom of the box is the machine readable metadata. Once I chose the box of cereal that I want to purchase and I take it to the front, the clerk like bleep over the sensor, and that metadata tells the store computer that I purchased this box of cereal and now it's time to order a new one from the company, restock, something like that. So it's got different metadata in it, 
but it's part of the inventory system of the store. And it, it triggers a whole automated process that the supermarket is, is built around. So it's another form of metadata that we're surrounded by every day. In the case of geospatial data, we're lucky that a lot of the tools that we can use can help us create these machine-readable data sets, uh, metadata sets. So the, a lot of the pain is much less these days than it was in the past. Uh, most of that machine-readable metadata gets generated in XML or in JSON, depending on the software that you're using. And as you see in the red, you know, guess which one of these two things is easiest for searching and discovery across multiple projects. It is the machine-readable version, for sure. So now that you kind of people are starting to feel more comfortable with, uh, with metadata itself, that's when we start to educate our audiences on, on uh, the different kinds of metadata that they can create. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to uh, let people know that there's different levels of metadata complexity that their organization can commit to. So there are very small schemas for metadata that can satisfy the needs of some projects and then very complex metadata schemas that are required uh, for certain other kinds of organizations. And uh, part of getting an organization to commit to uh, creating metadata that conforms to a standard is helping them pick the standard that works for the organization that, th that they work for. Because you don't want to burden them with a, a metadata type that uh, includes a lot of things that they don't need to do. Um, and so the graphics on the side here just show are, are from a, a slideshow that we used to do that has many more slides about metadata. But I wanted to keep some of the graphics just to show the sort of change in complexity. The top list is from a Dublin Core record. It's very simple, like just 14 fields. Um, the middle diagram is from an FGDC record. Uh, and you, all you need to know about the structure of that record is that there are elements in yellow that are required and elements that in green that are not necessarily required <coughs> depends on the depends on the situation and then the diagram down below is a uh, kind of a, a multi-bubble diagram of the ISO metadata scheme uh, and all the different parts of ISO metadata records that might be relevant depending on the kind of work that your organization does uh, so if anybody's interested in full-scale versions of these diagrams, I can provide them. Um, I didn't want to get into the details of metadata, except to just mention that there is this range. And so uh, when you're working with your organization on, um, on professionalizing your metadata for the first time, sometimes it's helpful to know that there is a range out there and to pick the correct place on that spectrum for your organization. When you do decide to get into metadata, it's important to um, look for the help that may be out there to help you. Um, ISO uh, standards, as Roger mentioned, are not easy to get your whole hands on. They cost money. Um, so often what's done with those is that people will create workbooks on how to use the standard. And you don't have to purchase the standard itself. You just have to get a, a copy of the free workbook and it helps you understand the standard and how to use it. So in the case of the US, NOAA has created these workbooks for learning the ISO formats. Um, there are two workbooks for the two, two of the flavors of the ISO metadata, and they're both very useful for understanding how the ISO uh, metadata is structured. And so I provide these links here because actually I think that these um, workbooks would be useful even outside the US. And I'm sure you guys have workbooks like this for, uh, for metadata in Europe, for the Inspire. Um, <clears throat> when you get into uh, creating metadata, if you have a lot of metadata records that you need to create because maybe you have a backlog of GIS that needs to be documented, there are a range of tools that you can employ. Uh, if you are an Esri user and, you, that, and you're using ArcMap or Arc uh, Pro, um, there are built-in tools that are part of that platform that will, should help you generate metadata as you go along. Um, 
In the QGIS environment, if you're using QGIS, there's actually quite a few different metadata plugins in the QGIS repository. And so I'm providing a link here in the slides to uh, a review of all of the metadata plugins in the QGIS library. Uh, and that review includes the pros and cons of each of the tools. Um, the, uh, the next list on the slide is a list of standalone tools that you can install on your desktop to help you uh, either create or in some cases serve metadata. So in the case of uh, some of these, they are OSGEO type projects like the uh, Geo Network or the GeoNode or the PyCSW. Uh, and then others of these are created by individual companies or uh, in the case of the EPA metadata editor that's created by uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. The last one on this list I added just yesterday because it was mentioned uh, by the Belgian project that they said that they were using something called MetaGIS. I have not looked it, looked it up, but I thought that it was interesting mention, so I put it on the list for something you can research. And then uh, several people maintain lists of tools for, for metadata, and I've linked one here from the US Federal uh, Geodata Commission. Oh. You guys made it yourself? Cool. Yeah. I didn't know, I had never heard of it before, and I asked the people who were sitting in the back row the other day, I was like, you heard of it? I didn't heard of it. And I Googled it, I was like, find something in Swedish, I like, I don't know, I don't know if that's, I don't think that's it, but that's cool. Uh, it's too late to manage our uh, web services. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, all of those kinds of tools that you might create internally are, 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 are part of your sort of whole data management process and relevant. Um, we also have a, a sort of, a, I would call it kind of like a data dictionary type service for inside of our coastal atlas that we created like t years and years ago to, to be able to provide like quick searching for data. And it's sometimes still the easiest thing to use, even though it's the oldest and the most simple thing. Uh, so, so you don't have to go full-blown geo node or geo platform um, in order to get some of the benefits of, of, of tracking metadata. You can definitely do things with home, homegrown tools. Okay, so um, uh, assuming by now that you've sort of bought into the idea that you it's a good idea to professionalize your uh, your data management and, and begin building metadata practices into everything that you do. Um, I've said some of this stuff already, uh, but um, use common sense. Don't, don't overburden your users with something that's too hard for them to follow. Try to make things as simple as possible because the simpler that it is, the more likely they will do it regularly. Um, implement things like templates that help them uh, easily create metadata records from a template that might be uh, two-thirds filled in already. Um, and in general, look at ways that you can make the process as easy as possible for the users who are inputting data, because the better uh, and more complete your metadata is, the better the user experience is on the other side when people are searching for data. So. A few best practices here. I mentioned using templates. Uh, one, one trick that you can do is you create a template for your organization. So your or, my organization might be Oregon Coastal Management Program, and we have a template that has all of our organizational information filled in. And then everything else is blank. So then how we use that template when we start a new project is we take that template and we fill in blocks of project information. And then that becomes a new template for the project. So now two thirds of the, the record are already filled in. And then the researcher only has to fill in the last part of the record that has to do specifically with his or her data set. And so uh, if they have 10 data sets, they just have to fill in the specifics of each data set. And they don't have to do the repetitive stuff about the institution or the project. All that information is already included in the template. So that's one example. 
of a way that you can institute an internal practice that will make life easier for everybody. Uh, another thing that can make life easier is that sometimes you might have a data set um, where you have multiple repeats, repeating information across different geographies. So only one thing will be changing and the rest of the metadata will be the same. So in those kinds of situations, this is kind of like another form of template. You create one good record that's like a master record and then you uh, essentially do something kind of like a, like a mail merge type of type of an exercise where you create the, the most of the record stays the same and then the part that varies maybe the geography or the species name uh, is put into a database and you do a giant database merge and generate a hundred or a thousand records for all your data sets at once in one one automated process so in that case there's really very little manual editing of metadata that's done uh, and you create if you as long as you as long as that first record you create is a good conformal record, the rest, the next 150 are perfect. Um, so you know if you're using ArcGIS, uh, it, it Arc Catalog can understand the concept of a template, and you can load templates in advance for your organization or for your project. So so some of the tools are really well set up for templates, and even if you're not using a tool like that. Some of the other things that I mentioned are easily scriptable. Um, so you could create, create your document in a in text editor, your master document in a text editor, and then merge variables in using a tool like Excel. So, so that's, that's templates. Might, might be helpful to those of you that have backlogs of metadata. Oops. Let's see. Um, more best practices, the ones, these best practices are helpful for uh, uh, making that discovery uh, part of the user experience a, a successful and happy one. Um, these are the areas of a metadata record that you should focus on so that the user has a good discovery experience. So in a, in a section where you talk about the identification of the layer, pay special attention to the title that you give the data set, the abstract, the important things like the publication date and contact information, and, uh, resource URLs if the data is downloadable or available as a service. Um, and then, of course, if you want the data set to be searchable, like using a map kind of an interface, the geography information that you load should be accurate. Otherwise, they won't be able to find the data geographically. Uh, and then, also, a really common way that people search for data is using keywords, like in a search interface. And so make sure that you put in good keywords and descriptions um, that, that, that include words that can be found in searches. Um, if you do these things well, then um, that usually ensures a good data discovery experience for the user. Uh, and if I had to do anything if I had to draw special attention to anything on here, I think all of them are important. But I think one of the ones that's sort of not paid as much attention sometimes is the title. And I'll just give a quick example. It's really, really common if you're a GIS uh, desk analyst to be working away, working away, working away. And it, the workflows of some GISs are that it, you revise and revise and revise a data set. And so what happens is you'll be like, I'm working on my birds data set. It'd be birds one, birds two, birds three, birds four. Birds four is not a good name for a data set when you go to publish in, in, in a catalog, right? I think we all know that, but that's super, super common, especially if the software that you use just takes the name of the data set and puts it in the title. So you should edit that, of course, but what should you put there instead of birds four? Well, uh, okay, you could take the four off. The data set is now about birds, okay, but that's still not very informative. Like, think about some of the other things in here that relate to good discovery, and think of your title as the result that comes back when someone does a search. It might be the only sentence that somebody reads about your data set. So in a way, the title is like a miniature abstract. And so it shouldn't just say birds, it should say shorebirds or seabirds and it shouldn't just say shorebirds or seabirds or maybe it should say shorebirds of the Oregon coast something like that give it a little bit more information and then 
it should probably the title should probably give an indication of who created it just for provenance so maybe a comma and then the organizational uh, acronym OCMP for Oregon Coastal Management Program and then the other thing that people are kind of curious about in a search result is is this really old data or is it new data so maybe another comma and then the year and that right there is now about eight or ten words long but it's suddenly so much more informative as a Google search result, for example, and much more likely for a user to click on it and sort of get the content of the data. And so if I had to put, you know, a little star, all these are important, but the title is really quite important. You can think of it as like, you know, you wouldn't send your kid to school uh, without his like shoes or his school bag. It's like you get your data dressed up to go out of the house. <laughs> it should look good when it goes out. That's what, that's what the title is for. Okay. So uh, just in general, best practices for sharing. Um, I'm assuming that if we're this far into the presentation, you've already decided that maybe it's a good idea that you are, well, if you're getting your house in order, you're more likely to be able to share. Um, and so if you're going to share, one of the first things that gets decided is sort of the license. Like, how are you going to share your data? Is it going to be freely available for anybody to download? Or do you need some kind of conditions to travel with the data? Is there a license that costs money that goes with the data? One of the first decisions is license. And then documenting that license, uh, along with the great titles, the informative abstracts, the credit to your organization, etc. Once you have made those decisions or created those things, then you can start sharing your, your data over the web, either with a, a catalog that you might be affiliated with in your network or on your own website if you host your own. And one of the things I wanted to mention here is that even within sharing, there are kind of, there's this, uh, levels of sharing that people um, can be uh, probably should be aware of. Um, we don't talk about this a lot because it's not usually like brought up in regular GIS conversation. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just explain the first couple levels in this, this hierarchy here to show you the spectrum. And I think that the first few levels will sound familiar to GIS people. So maybe the first time somebody approached you gave a good presentation at a conference. And somebody comes up to you afterwards, hey, that was a great paper, I really liked it, is it possible that I could get some of your data? And maybe you're willing to share, and the easiest way for you to share it is you take the paper itself and you put it on the scanner and you scan it into a PDF and you email it to that person. So what did they get? They got a scanned image that might have num numbers in it, but if they need to use those numbers, they'd have to like type them out again or something like that. And so that's kind of like a one-star level sharing. Uh, the next level up of sharing is, oh yeah, let me take your, e your email address, I'll email you a, a CSV file with the, num the numbers in an Excel file or something like that. Um, so the, the, the next level up is machine readable level of sharing. Uh, and it's not picky about the type of machine readable. So for example, I send you an Excel file. But what if you're an institution that can't read an Excel file. It's a proprietary file to, that you, for some reason, you don't have a license for opening it. So three-star sharing is when you share the data in a form that doesn't require a proprietary license to open it. A, a, a very common one between two-star and three-star here in the GIS world is if you share like in a file geodatabase, uh, a data set, with somebody who uses QGIS, and the file geodatabase version is a version that's not yet supported by their version of QGIS. So it's a digital file, it's machine readable, but it's only machine readable if you have the most latest copy of ArcMap. That can be a real problem. So the nicer way to do it is export the data for them in a format is, that can be read by the software that they have. So that's, I think, most of us, what we would like is to get to this third star level, where we can share data in, in non-proprietary formats that allows the users who can get the data to actually use it. Above this, I think there are other levels of sharing that are 
uh, interesting things to aspire to, depending on the field that you're in. Um, they be kind of become less and less relevant to the, the average GIS user. Um, but I put them on here just so that you can see what they are. And if anybody has any questions about them, I mean, I have myself have not done many things that are at those levels, but we've had conversations in our organization about what we would do. Um, and it'd be interesting to see a project that did implement these levels. Um, so one of the things I'm going to talk about in the last part of this session is the ICANN project. And uh, in ICANN, we talked about a lot of metadata and teaching people how to publish catalogs. And um, we came up with sort of two interoperability levels that people could uh, instantiate in their projects. One was, uh, at level one was writing good metadata and creating a, a project or a catalog that uh, has a catalog service. And level two was uh, a next level of organization where you organize all the keywords in your metadata to conform to a particular set of standard keywords that are used by others in your field. So that when you talk about uh, seabirds and I talk about seabirds and we both end up talking about a specific species, we end up getting similar data when we search on those terms. So um, I put these slides in there from the ICANN project in case they're of interest for people to follow. I think always people want to like work on this interoperability level one before they get to level two. If you can organize your keywords at the same time that you're doing the other stuff, that's great. Um, and it's kind of like a two for one uh, level, uh, you know, win, I said, for your level of effort. Um, okay. I think we've got a lot of data here about catalogs. I think you won't need all that detail, but mostly I wanted to say that there are a lot of catalog uh, options out there. Um, I probably didn't even put them all on the slide, but this was just quickly what I uh, could find in terms of very common icons, for example. Um, and when you're selecting a software that might be helpful for hosting a catalog inside, I just put a checklist here of the kinds of questions you should be asking yourself. Uh, and you should be asking of those products to see if they meet your needs. And then last slide in this module is, um, assuming you have bought into all of this uh, successful sharing concepts, um, you should work with your <coughs> internal users, know them as an audience, in order to entice them into good practices that will enable successful sharing. And then know your external audiences to try to anticipate their needs. Um, maybe open up the data sets that are most requested first. Put the effort there. When you have some big w early wins, then will become more acceptable to make all of your data uh, accessible. Um, basically, going back to the first heading of the first slide, you are your own first customer. So if you write good documentation today for a data set and you are still in your job five years from now, you may be the person that's benefiting from that well-written record. And so this, this is kind of a famous uh, screen, uh, picture that someone took at a conference. Um, metadata is a love note to the future. The love note might be going to yourself or some other future person. But it's kind of a much nicer way of thinking about metadata than some of the uh, more negative ways that people historically have thought of it as a burden. So, that is that. Uh, I didn't have a poll for this section, but I was kind of curious to just ask people if they've had a lot of good or bad experiences with metadata, because I feel like a lot of people have had both, maybe more negative than positive. And I was curious if any of these ideas seem helpful or if there's any ideas that you've used locally that might have worked as well for you that I didn't mention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 That's like a form of license. Yeah, a license condition. 
um, uh, a license. I think that that works probably well with people who are in the science community. We, we have found that the, there's different problems in different sort of sectors of our user groups. Um, folks who are in science agencies oftentimes will sit on a lot of data for a long time. It's kind of in this like gray space, gray literature space. It's been, they've talked about it at conferences, but they haven't published a white paper yet. And so in that time, that gray time, nobody can get at the information. And sometimes it can be like a decade or something like that. And, it's, um, and sometimes you wonder if it ever comes out. So the, in those kinds of situations, I think you need enticements like that to um, really get people on the bandwagon. Um, the other thing that ha works with academics, and I know there's some academics in the room, so I don't want to insult anybody, but oftentimes uh, a little bit of like, um, if you get everyone else sharing first, and then the academics see that their stuff is not there, they're like, why isn't my stuff there? And they get a little bit jealous, and, and, and ego actually starts to help you. Uh, but it really depends on whether it's an individual or if it's an institutional uh, breakdown. Um, so we've, we've had those kinds of individuals where that's happened. And then we've had, uh, uh, but if it's usually an institution, there's more people that you can work with and they're not all the same attitude. So, yeah. Any others? Somebody's this, project. This paper, yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Cleaning up a mess after somebody else. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we that has really helped us a lot, um, especially in our early days when we were doing um, lots of first time digitization or conversion from old formats to new formats. There was, you know, you need to generate a new metadata record, but the minor changes are minor or they're very repetitive. So templates for the win. Yeah. And, and really, almost any kind of software can do sort of template substitution. If you have like a Word document and an Excel document, you can do it. And you save as text and you're good. Mm -hmm. Should be required. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true, and we we are a little bit better. I think like that. We're lucky in the U.S. that that's uh, becoming more practice, standard practice. Um, it still doesn't solve that gray literature problem sometimes because they consider they're like, yes, it will be public. They just don't commit to when, you know. So. Um, yeah, it really depends. I mean, some people sit on data for a long time. And you have to kind of ask yourself, is, is the data, is it relevant? Is it contributing to the community conversation, you know, if it's held too closely for too long, you know? So that's, I guess, another ad argument that could be made. I think we're running behind here, but then my last one is cool quite quick and we have some slides, uh, some sites we can look at. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was using these data in data and applications. And I wanted to quickly run through some resources that are very helpful um, that come from the ICANN community. So I'll quickly say that in Oregon, we have a project that was like a coastal atlas created many years ago. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, we started 
having relationships with other people that had coastal atlases, and pretty soon this network was formed called ICANN, and eventually it became uh, part of IODE, and basically uh, it's just a, a network of people who work on these kinds of coastal applications that kind of consistently illustrate the coast. Um, and what that community of practice does is it shares uh, experiences, uh, best practices, uh, lessons learned uh, across the community. Um, so uh, ICANN has created a number of publications that have summarized the findings of, of, of a lot of these discussions and they can be really helpful for when you are uh, considering building a data, uh, a data application from scratch. So I was just going to recommend some of those to you. Uh, I kind of explained what ICANN is and who the membership is. There's a link to the project of ICANN. Um, and I think the main thing to mention on this slide is just to say that they're defining a coastal atlas in a very kind of a specific way, which is um, something that's systematically illustrating the coast, uh, not necessarily focusing only on one uh, area or one topic. Um, and also supplementing ma digital maps with other kinds of information like tables and illustrations and photographs and stuff like that so that the user um, is getting, getting a, a kind of a rich experience about the nature of, of the different aspects of the coast. And uh, of the members of ICANN, um, some of them originally joined uh, because they had like a hard copy atlas product. So in, in Belgium they had this was the first coastal atlas that they had, and then they created a second copy table version and a website that went with it. Um, and now the, the new project is sort of like a successor to that product. I don't think this is online anymore. Uh, and so we have both members that started in hard copy and went to digital, or people who had a digital product first and then eventually cr decided to maybe create a hard copy offshoot. Um, we're not really... Uh, even though most of uh, the work that people are doing is digital, um, I think we think that there's a lot to be learned from like uh, traditional atlases that have always been published, and so so we kind of take those lessons where we can find them. Uh, and the members who are in ICANN work on atlases of all different scales, so from very local to very wide region, ranging. This is a screenshot from the first version of the African Marine Atlas. And so the scale of an atlas is not important. What's important is more the systemic approach to, to illustrating the coast. Um, of the ICANN objectives, the ones that I would highlight here are that we'll uh, um, have a network of people who enjoy working on technical topics. And so one of the things they like to do is provide technical support to projects. Um, and, and then also engaging with stakeholders of atlases to discern sort of what is working, what doesn't work, uh, and then feeding those kinds of lessons back into the community. Uh, in general, this is kind of considered in a lot of ways contributing to technical capacity building, but it sort of has a really specific focus on usability and applicability of data to solving sort of coastal management topics. Uh, ICANN meets um, in person every couple of years, but in between times they try to sometimes organize workshops in conjunction with standing conferences. So if we hear that a lot of people are going to a conference like Littoral or Coast GIS, then we can have them organize a small session while they're there. And then that sometimes will give visibility to the network in other areas um, than the core areas of ICANN. Um, I've got some screenshot here of some of the publications that I'll talk about next. Um, one of the first major publications that ICANN created was actually a hard copy book, where each chapter of the book was written by a series of ICANN members. And um, some of the, this book is kind of hard to find because it was a hard copy. There weren't that many of them published, but um, all of the chapters are available digitally. Some of them are available via Ocean Docs, and so I've linked here in the slides uh, to um, the one in Ocean Docs that has the table of contents and the first few chapters. Um, and if there's a chapter that you see in the table of contents that you're interested in, you can email me and I can probably get it for you because each of the authors of the chapters were given their chapter by the publisher and authorized <coughs> to share with anybody who asks. So this is a, a, a listing of the types of things that are covered in this book. Um, they cover, you know, the building blocks of coastal atlases, uh, you know, 
what kinds of data people put in them, how they group them thematically, how they create legends, how they create uh, linkages to metadata and services, how they engage in op interoperability if they do. Um, they had a number of Atlas case studies from around the world, one chapter per case study. And then uh, some chapters in the end of the book relating atlases to the SDI efforts, uh, to usability science, and to, uh, in general, sustaining and growing an atlas once you have one and, uh, in, in, and you want to keep it successful and going. Another, another major area of work uh, in ICANN has produced some publications related to working with users of atlases. Um, so this one was uh, published after ICANN joined IODE, and sometimes I've seen copies here. Um, you can probably find one. This is available digitally on Ocean Docs, and the link is, is included. Um, it contains a lot of helpful information for understanding user needs and then uh, designing a new, an application to meet those needs. Uh, the book was compiled by interviewing lots of Atlas developers and then extracting relevant information from ICANN reports. And when they summarized all the information, they got two sets of recommendations, one for people that were starting a new Atlas and another one for people who are taking care of an existing Atlas and how do you keep your audience engaged and how do you keep your Atlas fresh, etc. So that's an interesting one that you can get. It's freely downloadable on Ocean Docs. And I didn't know uh, if I should link these also in the Moodle, if they're already on Ocean Docs. I didn't want to create a duplicate copy. I just didn't know. So I, they're in the slides, and I can make a duplicate link. Um, the last area that's the most recent area that ICANN has been working on is uh, when you're creating a, a data application, usually you have a reason for why you're creating it. There's an audience that you're trying to reach, a politician or a political process or a social process that you're trying to participate in. Uh, and those processes or audiences have stories that they uh, that that are that are ongoing, and you should think about those stories when you're designing uh, your your atlas. Because basically, if you can tailor the content of your atlas to the story of the day, it will be more relevant to your audience. Um, in the I can uh, in in the uh, I can mini workshop that was in Colombia last year. Uh, they did an OTGA course on ocean literacy, and ICANN members did a module on uh, using tools from online journalism, such as story maps, uh, to integrate sort of narrative, uh, interactive uh, stories into atlases um, in, in ways that sort of are more interesting than what a traditional uh, digital flat map can, can do. Um, so the slides for that uh, class are also available on Ocean Teacher in another course. I included this, the link there. And then this is a screenshot from one of one of the slide one of the the, the course uh, slides in that course uh, where we talked about some of the technologies that are available from the digital journalism community, from Esri, from uh, communities like Mapbox or, or 3D uh, tools like Cesium for uh, telling different kinds of stories. Stories that follow geographies or stories that follow timelines, stories that look at before and after effects of, of, of an event, um, and so on. Stories that cover space and time. Uh, there's a lot more to this. If people are interested, I can get into it uh, some more or crack open some other slides. Um, but for now, I thought I would kind of get you interested in the topic by showing this slide. And then last but not least, um, the story thing is kind of leading in this direction. But essentially, when you're creating a digital application, you're trying to produce something that connects a lot of dots for your users. So. Your user doesn't have time to go out there and count birds or count blades of seagrass or, or think about why there are a lot more of them this year than last year, that kind of thing. What you're doing is you're taking that uh, raw data, turning it into curated information with a story wrapped around it that sort of explains the trends or where we are in, 
you know, maybe a decadal cycle or a climate change uh, trend. And you're presenting that story to them with information that's already kind of uh, cartographically pleasing um, and, and easy to interpret. And uh, to the best of your abilities, if you can connect the map with other forms of information like scientific references or photographs or metadata or service links or downloads, suddenly the uh, application that you've created out of a mere data set or two is a much more rich resource for your users. So that is like the quick, uh, you know, eight minute introduction to ICANN, but hopefully gives you interested in the topics that ICANN works on. Uh, if you have any kind of questions about ICANN work, you can please um, send them to either myself or Catherine Kopke, whose emails are here. And if you think that ICANN could be helpful in any of your projects, we'd love to learn about it. Um, we do most of our work between meetings via WebEx webinars. And so we can easily convene a webinar of uh, interested parties if you have a topic that you'd like to discuss or a project that you'd like to share. So that's all I've got.